Hello there, my name is Purple Dan and welcome to Geology 303. In this video series, we'll be taking a look at what's happening beneath our feet, from the slow movement of the continents to the violent outbursts of fury from volcanoes. Each of these events have a story to tell. We just have to listen. For today's introductory video, we will be focusing on the composition of Earth, what it is made up of and the structure of the Earth, as well as how do we know it? Earth is composed of layers, each of their own unique physical and chemical properties. Starting from the top, we have the crust, which averages about 35 kilometers in thickness. Going down, we reach the Moravic discontinuity, which marks the beginning of the upper mantle. The upper mantle extends down to about 700 kilometers. Now, there is a transition zone between 410 and 600 kilometers, which would mark the beginning of the lower mantle. The lower mantle extends down to 2,885 kilometers, which by then you reach the Gutenberg discontinuity, which marks the beginning of the liquid outer core. The outer core extends down to 5,155 kilometers, which marks then the which were called the Lehman discontinuity. It's now known only as the inner outer liquid solid discontinuity. Below the outer core, you have the inner core, which extends all the way to the center of Earth, which is 6,371 kilometers deep. There are two types of crust, oceanic crust and continental crust. Oceanic crust is relatively thin, averaging only 10 kilometers in thickness. It also has a relatively uniform stratigraphy. We actually know this by studying ophiolite suits, which is oceanic crust abducted onto continental crust. Ophiolite suits consist of, from top to bottom, sediments, pillow extruded basalts, sheeted igneous dikes, overlaid onto gabbro igneous extrusion rocks, which is finally overlaid onto ultramatic mantle material. Continental crust is much thicker. It varies between 20 kilometers all the way to 19 kilometers thick, averaging about 30 kilometers. Its composition is highly variable though due to heavy tectonic action, although the overall composition averages down to something called granodiorite. We will discuss continental rocks and of course oceanic rocks in a later video when we deal with the Wilson cycle. The mantle can be divided into two categories, namely the upper mantle and the lower mantle. The upper mantle extends from about 60 kilometers to about 410 kilometers. It's composed out of an ultramafic rock called peridotite. The composition is not homogeneous, however. Initially, the composition starts out olivine rich and gets more spinel rich the lower you go. You will notice that I said around 700 kilometers, you go into the lower mantle region. This is not 100% accurate, however, since there is a transition zone between the upper mantle and lower mantle. This zone is about 250 kilometers deep. The reason it varies is because when you look at these layers, they're not perfectly spherical. They vary all over Earth. So at one point, you might have to dig down 700 kilometers to reach the upper mantle. At one point, you might have to dig down 450 kilometers. This zone is actually clearly visible when studying seismics. The lower mantle extends down to about 2,898 kilometers. Its composition is also peridotite. Initially, at above 600 kilometers, it's spinel rich, varying down to perovskite rich. You also notice that here is written 2,885 kilometers instead of the 2,898. Again, these layers of Earth are not uniform in diameter. They do vary from place to place. The core also can be divided into two parts, namely the outer core and the inner core. 
The outer core extends from 2,898 kilometers all the way down to 5,155 kilometers. It's composed of an iron nickel liquid alloy. The inner core is an iron rich solid extending down to the center of Earth, which is about 6,371 kilometers deep. Now, the question would be how do we know these things if we can't access the interior of Earth? Unfortunately, we cannot directly observe what's going on inside the mantle, and studying magma can only really tell us about crustal or mantle interaction, not about the actual composition of the mantle if you isolate that. It's too contaminated. Luckily, some tectonic action can bring mantle material to the surface. An example would be a kimberlite eruption. The ejector from a kimberlite eruption will contain material that was sourced from the upper mantle. Hence, we can study these rocks which are uncontaminated and get an idea of the chemical properties of the mantle. To study material that's even deeper, like in the outer core and inner core, is simply impossible. There's no tectonic action that can bring that material to the surface. For that, we actually have to look into space. All major silicate bodies in our solar system are formed from the same accretionary disk. Eventually, as protoplanets form, they can bump into each other, sending samples of their cores flying around the solar system, and these can eventually return to Earth. We can then study them, which gives us a really good idea of the early mantle and the core composition of Earth. The physical properties of Earth is slightly more difficult to analyze. We use a technique similar to medical doctors. When a medical doctor uses sonar to look at a baby inside a womb, we use the same principle to look what's going on inside Earth. We don't have a sonar gun big enough to create that amount of shock waves, but we do have earthquakes. And sometimes when nuclear explosions goes off, we have man wave shock waves as well. From the epicenter of an earthquake, we will have shock waves traveling through the entirety of Earth. Depending on the density of the material that's going through, it's going to change the speed. The more dense the material, the quicker the shockwave is going to travel through them. This is an overview of how we can determine the density of the entire Earth and give us an idea where there's terminations in density, which will then tell us what type of material it is, be it a solid, a semi-solid or a liquid. In this picture, you can clearly see the variance of velocity as shock waves travel through the mantle. S waves means shear waves. Shear waves can travel through a semi-solid like the mantle, but can't travel through the liquid like the outer core. Instead, these shear waves will then translate into compressional waves, known as P waves on this diagram. You can clearly see how these terminate at the outer core at 3,000 kilometers deep, and how they change again at just past 5,000 kilometers when you hit the solid interior core again. Using this data, we can clearly make a model of how the interior of Earth looks like. That brings us to the end of this introductory lecture on the interior of Earth. Before you go on, I would like you to subscribe to a guy called The Living Past. Guy has an excellent series on paleontology. I absolutely love his videos. Please go give him some love and subscriptions. If you did enjoy this video, don't forget to like it. And the likey thing in magic there. And most importantly, give some feedback on this video. Do you like this style? If you're yourself a geologist or anything, comments or feedback, or criticism is always welcome. If I made any errors in the video, Please bring it to light so I can fix it. I do not want videos with wrong information on YouTube, especially if they're not aimed at education, teaching people about geology. The aim of this video series is to have my own idea of a series that you can use to educate people on geology, from people with no interest in, uh, in actually studying geology, but with some interest in knowing on what's going on beneath our feet, as well as to people actually in university, especially in first year, who would like sort of a, a quick crash course on, well, geology, which you will be able to see in your future studies. So please, subscribe, do the commenty thing below, and uh, the next video will be on the Wilson cycle. 
If you have absolutely no idea what the Wilson cycle is, well, you will find out, but spoiler, it's about tectonic interaction between continental plates. It's pretty interesting, also pretty complex, because in this video, or in that video, I am not going to just cover it on a layman perspective, I'm really going to go into depth. So you could actually use that video to study, if you're doing geology yourself. Thank you very much for watching and have an awesome day.